Welcome to Sustainably Speaking. I'm so excited for today's episode because we've been working on it for almost two years. I'm going to introduce you to two geniuses, Ray Bonatow and Peter Chevelle from Google X's The Moonshot Factory. They're thinking differently about how to solve some of the world's biggest problems. We're here at South by Southwest, kind of see Austin behind us and we're having a great time. And I dragged these two over here <laughs> to talk about the amazing things they're doing. So thank you both for being here. Yeah, it's been a great week. Um, let's talk a little bit about Moonshot. We're going to break all of this down, but let's talk about Moonshot Factory. Tell us what it is and what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so we're known as X the Moonshot Factory. We used to be called Google X. So we are a sister company to Google, technically. We're under the Alphabet family of companies. Alphabet's the parent company. And we were started, gosh, almost 14 or 15 years ago when the founders wanted to start working on uh, projects outside of the normal Google products at the time. And um, you might have heard of some of those early moonshot projects. Waymo, the self-driving car, was the first one. It came out of there. Um, and we've We've been evolving over the last 15 years. Um, if there's one thing constant about X, the Moonshot Factory, is we're never the same. We're always evolving. And Peter, what are you guys working on? Well, the factory itself is working on a broad range of topics, but there's a few key things that we always try and keep in mind when we're working. We want to solve the world's largest problems. And so we want to work on something that impacts hundreds of millions or billions of people. The second is we try and look at it from a different lens than others. So we try and use a way that others wouldn't think of to try and solve these problems because a lot of people are trying the ways that are obvious today. So we have to think out of the box. And the third is we try and use breakthrough technologies that we have available to us today or that are coming available in the near future so that we can really push the boundaries on these solutions. And right now, um, some very important topics that we're seeing are climate, CO2, health, a, a broad range of areas, communication, and we're leveraging the capabilities that come with being an alphabet and being a sister company to Google to try and solve those really challenging areas. We're here, we're talking about plastics, we're talking about sustainability. Can you kind of tell us about what you're doing? Yeah, so um, we're part of the Moonshot for Circularity. So I, I lead that project. Um, we have a great talented team of people from all diverse backgrounds and, and experiences. Um, you know, we looked at the waste problem, right? As it's, it's the world is going to keep consuming and not just plastics, but all materials. And whenever we need these important materials that make modern society function, we have to keep extracting raw materials. And that takes a lot of energy and resources, adds to CO2 emissions, and that therefore affects our climate. And so when we look at that problem, we ask ourselves, well, what, what are the root causes or root challenges around waste and how might we think about dealing with that differently. And to us, the circular economy or circularity, the idea of taking a material and putting it back into a form that it could be reused possibly infinitely, we think that that is really an audacious idea and in our view is probably moonshot worthy. And so we kind of narrowed in on that. Um, and plastics, um, I mean, I know we're going to get into the, the, all the issues around plastics, but plastics to us was a great place to start um, because there's actually an industry today actively trying to solve that problem. And I think in comparison, there are other material classes that maybe we don't have all the infrastructure totally set up yet. Now, there's still a lot of room to improve plastics and recycling and all the efforts there, but at least there were a few pieces where a moonshot project could conceptually start. Well, I think we're all thrilled to hear that. Yeah. And I, it was cool to hear you talk about circular economy and circularity because we talk about it a lot and people's eyes sort of glaze over yeah. and they're like, what? Um, so I think when you drew the full circle, you don't want to just be linear with it, yes. throw it away, yeah. but how can we make it into something else and keep it going and going and going? Is that the idea? Yeah. And I think the economy part, let's not forget about that, right? So there's the environmental impacts of like needing to re-extract and then throwing it away and re-extract. But think about how much money we spend doing that every year, right? Like for something like plastics, we're, we're spending billions, hundreds of billions of dollars extracting that, turning that into plastics and then throwing it away. There's value in that material. Now, of course, 
there are economic challenges that we have to solve along the way, but we feel as the Moonshot Factory, those are challenges that we're up for trying to solve. Okay, so how are we approaching this? I think one of the key areas that we focused on is data. Um, plastics have become much more complex than people realize. Everyone thinks of a water bottle, but there's so much more to it than that. And there's labels and there's dyes and there's all these things that have to be figured out. And in many people's eyes, it's an oversimplified issue. In our case, what we believe is that there is great actors doing great things, as Ray points out, with the industry. And they're challenged because they don't have all the information they need to make the solutions a reality in this economic manner. And so we focused on better informing the sector from the start of the materials to the end of life in such a manner that we can make the most informed decisions, create the most value from these materials and keep as many of them back in the loop as we can. One thing that we saw was missing was more granular, high quality data about waste, plastic waste, the composition of plastic waste, and then how that is gonna affect recycling. And so we started on that journey and it all actually started with just data collection. Like what better data could we collect and what kind of tools and technologies could we use to collect that better data and inform folks like the recycling industry about plastic waste, where it is, the quality of it, and the effect on recycling processes. What kind of data did you collect that like made maybe some of the biggest differences in where, where you're going now? Yeah, I think, you know, to answer that, you have to understand a little bit about modern plastics and how they're made, especially in modern packaging. Um, plastics are not just plastics. There's there's a handful of different polymer types, right? The basic type of plastic that it is. So I'm talking about like polyethylene that makes things like milk jugs, um, PET, which makes water bottles, um, and the list goes on and on. Like whatever this microphone is made <laughs> exactly. out of. Exactly. Yeah. Like plastics are used, they're, they're important materials that make everyday modern society function. Um, but it's not just one thing. They're complicated materials. And we saw that the recycling industry wasn't really getting that type of information to inform the effect on the recycling process. And if you're going to re-incentivize recycling economically, you need to increase the value of the outputs of recycling. And the only way you're going to do that is by understanding what comes in, right? Like yeah. there's that age old adage of garbage in, garbage out. We apply that to concepts like AI and machine learning. It also applies literally to recycling. If you put poor quality materials in, you're going to get poor quality materials out. And so we needed to understand that at the molecular data level. So where are you on this journey? Well, we have collected that data and we've kind of plugged this all in together with the machine learning and AI capabilities that we've developed to look at materials in a new way, look at them at a deeper, more molecular level. We understand that plastics will be ubiquitous in society for the foreseeable future. And so we're hoping that we can pull this stream together in a, a sort of ecosystem or platform approach across the industry and, and really help everyone with circularity. And uh, I'll add to that. There's some tangible things that we are now working with the industry on. So the first is we've collected pretty large data set on plastic waste and the composition of it at the molecular level. And I'm talking about like multi-materials, what additives are in there, and then connecting that with recyclers to the effect on the recycling process. And that cross the span of recycling processes from mechanical recycling all the way through different forms of advanced recycling. And I bet a lot of people are like, what do you mean other forms of advanced recycling? What are we talking about in a top level? We can define advanced recycling. Um, so advanced recycling is a ultimately a blanket term that describes multiple different, let's just call them chemical processes okay. to break materials like plastics down to their basic subunits. So the basic molecule that makes up a polymer or a plastic. Polymer is like the actual molecule that makes up many plastics. They're made up of these subunits. And so the idea behind advanced recycling is if you could break down those plastics to their original subunits, you could then reassemble them back into virgin-like molecules, but not from raw petroleum, but that, that that's virgin petroleum that's been extracted, but from stuff that's already been extracted, that's already above ground. And so for us, we like that idea. That's an audacious idea that's worth exploring. To us, that has moonshot potential because we're really interested in the idea of what if you didn't have to keep extracting petroleum? 
to make the world function without losing things like performance or, or economic value to these materials. So plastic becomes exactly what it was again. Exactly. And I think also some people may ask or think, isn't that already happening? And I don't, maybe you guys can help yeah. them understand why more is needed. I think people are like, but yeah. I've been recycling for years. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that what's happening? Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of recycling, um, I think most of society is familiar with uh, what's called mechanical recycling in, yeah, in the like, industry. Yeah, like yeah recycling. traditional recycling. And that's, I mean, I think we can talk about collection in the blue bin later, mm -hmm. but Imagine it actually, you, you collect this plastic, it actually gets to a recycling center, it gets sorted out, and then it gets to the actual recycler. What happens next? So in mechanical recycling, um, assuming once it's been sorted, um, usually that plastic has to get shredded up, uh, usually gets washed a little bit, and then put back into what's called an extruder, where you're melting the shredded plastic and you're melting it all back together. But that mechanical process, you actually downgrade that polymer or that plastic, the, the, the long molecule that makes up the performance of that plastic gets kind of downgraded a little bit every cycle you do that. So in reality, you only get a few cycles out of that before you have to actually add virgin materials back in. And that's fine. Like we actually need mechanical recycling because that's the only option most of the industry has today that's at industrial scale. And it works beautifully for things like water bottles, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Things that are very clean, that don't have a lot of pigments or additives, things that are not multi-layers of different types of plastic, but it doesn't work for everything, right? And don't get me started on textiles. Like textiles is a whole nother class of materials that, that also, by the way, are made up of plastics that need a lot of solutions there. And this is where advanced recycling comes in. We see it as a complementary next level of recycling that is meant to break the material down and then upgrade the resulting molecules. So maybe you have to add less virgin back to get performance. And maybe you don't have to add virgin materials back at all to get performance, right? That's the unlock potential we see. But let's also just acknowledge that this is a newer technology. It's, it's newer in the industry and it's gonna take time to like de-risk that. And that's a role that we often embrace at X. We see ourselves as an organization that has the patience and the capital to kind of take head on large R&D challenges and knowing that you may not get it right the first time. In fact, we're, we're usually never right the first time, but you have to have that patience and willingness to de-risk that over a period of time. And that's why we think we're perfectly suited to help the industry figure out, hey, how do we make advancements in advanced recycling happen faster. We actually have a pilot project. Uh, we're working out of a material recovery facility. This okay. is a waste facility where, again, imagine you put some a recyclable in the blue bin, it, it gets picked up by a truck, it hauls it to this center. Okay. This center is where we have a pilot of our, our technology deployed. And what we found was at this waste facility, they can't recycle everything. Mm -hmm. Fact of the plastics, the only thing they really can recycle are the clear, milk jugs and the clear water bottles. Everything else- Clear has, milk jugs. Yeah, okay. like they, they need it natural. Okay. Um, the colored, the plastics that have like pigments and the different colors, it's gonna be lower value for their markets. Okay. Um, it is technically all recyclable, but, yep. but, but in that market, it's hard for them to find a market. It's a more rural market. Hard so. for them to find someone to then wanna buy it and yeah, use it again. Exactly. Okay. Now what we do is we thought, well, why don't we, try to give that landfill bound plastic a second chance. And because we have this understanding of like advanced recycling, new recycling technologies, and including mechanical recycling, we put all of that, we'll call it residual plastic. It's plastic that's been passed up for mechanical recycling into our process and look for value. And what we found was there's still residual materials that have value for mechanical. There's still uh, materials that are going to be highly valuable to advanced recycling that mechanical recycling is not going to want. So there's room to give these mater materials a chance at recycling and not have to head to landfill. And so we've actually been doing live projects with partners uh, at this facility demonstrating that. So, so it's possible. like a second chance for what we thought were rejects, yeah. but they're not. And they're not. then where are we taking them? Well, in these cases, we're taking them back to the packaging products of today. So we were taking right. what would otherwise have gone into the ground. We would have had to go out somewhere, extract and replace. 
and we're taking that material back and it has gone back into new packaging for today, new products for today. And in many cases, things like automotive, textiles, all of those kind of things. So what once was, to your point, a reject is now the products we're, we're holding today. How can we make that happen everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, our Moonshot project, we're we're still early in our journey. We, we, we're still a small team. We're a lot like a startup. So we have to be very picky about where we spend our time and which projects. Um, uh, but we are super open to partnerships. Um, we've been partnering across the entire value chain Great. from chemical companies to waste management companies to even the brands and then the, the, the manufacturers who make the packaging. Thank you guys. Really appreciate you guys being here. And we've learned a lot. This might go to two episodes. <laughs> I'm inspired and we probably only covered a small sliver of what they're actually tackling. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did hearing from people who think about things really differently. I'll see you next time on Sustainably Speaking.